Let's all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB, Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. At Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning and welcome to Sunday with, well, I'm afraid it's me, Angela Rippon, who's standing in for Michael Portillo this week. And uh, what I'd like you to do is settle in for two hours of arts, current affairs and good conversation. And indeed, we're going to be starting off with the incredible developments in Russia and the military coup that... Um, just never was. The head of the Wagner mercenaries pulled his forces back from the brink after threatening to overrun Moscow, while Rear Admiral Chris Parry of the Royal Navy and Chairman of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, are going to be joining us to, uh, to give us their perspective on just what has been going on over the last 24 hours. And it's the big issue that's facing so many households right now, mortgages. Well, the Bank of England has raised interest rates yet again to, this time, 5%. And there is no end in sight to these punishing rises. So a broker from The Mortgage Mum is going to talk us through what it all means. We're also going to take a look back at that terrible tragedy in the Atlantic after waiting on tender hooks for news of the five men in the submersible to explore the Titanic wreck, counting down the hours of just how much oxygen they had left, only to find out that the vessel had actually been destroyed days earlier with 
all lives lost. Well, Titanic expert Julie Cook uh, had planned to make that same journey herself just a few years ago, so she's going to be joining me to tell us uh, just why it is that the Titanic stood shunted off the news at 10 after his appearance on comedy panel show Have I Got News For You. Now, was the BBC uh, overreacting or should news readers actually avoid comedy shows altogether when they just might come across as being a bit biased? Well, GB News' own comedy panellists are going to have their say. And finally, for this hour, we're going to have our resident arts critic Stefan Kariazis here to tell us just what he's been seeing in the West End this week. And also, much later in the show, I'm going to be joined by the fabulous Kiki D for a Glastonbury weekend treat. You're not going to want to miss that. But before all of that, let's get you up to speed with the latest news headlines from Titania. Angela, thank you very much and good morning. This is the latest from the GB newsroom. The Kremlin says the criminal charges against the leader of the Wagner mercenary group will be dropped and he'll go to Belarus. Yevgeny Prigozhin last night ordered his fighters to turn back from Moscow to avoid bloodshed. They were on their way to the city to remove Russian commanders that Prigozhin blames for mishandling the war in Ukraine. Local media has reported that all transport restrictions in the Rostov region have now been lifted. Well, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he's in touch with allies about the armed rebellion. As I said, we've been monitoring for a while the potential of Russia's in illegal invasion in Ukraine to be destabilising. And that's obviously this, you've seen the situation as it's developing. We're keeping a close eye on that. We're in touch with our allies as the situation evolves. I'll be speaking to some of them later today. And the most important thing is for all parties to behave responsibility, responsibly and to protect civilian lives. The Prime Minister has set out what he's calling the biggest workforce training expansion of the NHS. Writing in the Sunday Times, Mr Sunak said his NHS long-term workforce plan will aim to train, retain and reform the UK's experienced NHS staff. He says, as a country, we rely on attracting talented people from overseas rather than recruiting at home. Mr Sunak described the 15-year plan as the cornerstone of his government's vision for a better healthcare system. The Chancellor says raising interest rates is one of the most effective methods to curb inflation. This week, rates were hiked up to 5% from 4.5%, the 13th rate rise in a row and the sharpest increase since February. The move means mortgage holders are preparing for a big jump in their monthly repayments. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Jeremy Hunt is urging those struggling to be patient with the painful measures. Chief Secretary to the Treasury, John Glenn, told GB News the Chancellor's committed to supporting the Bank of England. As you know, the Bank of England is independent of government. We work closely with them, but they make those decisions, and they've obviously increased our rates by half a percent last week. I'm not here to commentate. I'm here to work closely with the Bank of England. People uh, don't want us to be uh, squabbling amongst ourselves. What we should be doing is having a committed and united plan to deal with high inflation in our economy. That is what we're doing in government, and that is what the Governor of the Bank of England is doing with the interest rate decisions. Canadian police looking into the deaths of five people killed in the implosion of the Titan submersible. They say they're assessing whether they'll launch a full criminal investigation into what happened. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada is interviewing those who were on board the Polar Prince ship that launched the vessel into the sea. Inspectors say the investigation could take up to two years. Human remains have been found where British actor Julian Sands went missing in the area of the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles. They've been transported to the local coroner's office pending positive identification. It's expected that should be completed by next week. The 65-year-old failed to return from a hike in the Mount Baldy area of the Southern Californian Mountains on January 13th. All state secondary schools in England are now equipped with a defibrillator. The government says secondary schools receive priority because the risk of cardiac arrest increases with age. The Department for Health says the device will also be rolled out in primary and special schools due to be completed by the end of the summer term. 
And finally, the Princess of Wales teamed up with tennis champion Roger Federer to celebrate Wimbledon ball boys and girls. Kate joined the eight-time Wimbledon champion and watched a training session where youngsters were hoping to impress selectors and bag one of the 250 spots for the tournament that starts next week. The princess, who's the club's patron, has praised the hard work of the ball boys and girls, describing them as amazingly professional. You're with GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Angela. Thanks so much, Tatiana. Now, the events in Russia have been dizzying over the past 24 hours. The leader of the ruthless Wagner mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, took over the uh, southern city of Rostov-on-Don on Saturday morning, and he started marching for justice, as he put it, all the way to Moscow. Well, it looked uh, very much like a military coup, and certainly the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, denounced his former sidekick as a traitor, and he did look very worried. But it does appear that a deal has now been struck to avert bloodshed. So, to unpack what's been going on, I'm pleased to be joined by Rear Admiral Chris Parry, former NATO commander and a Russian expert, as well as Conservative MP, former Defence Minister and Chairman of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood. Chris, can I start with you first of all? I'd like to get your assessment of what's went on over the last 24 hours. What the heck happened yesterday? Yeah, good morning. I'm trying to work it out myself. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, so we have to go on what people said and what they did. Um, my sense is that uh, you have to view Russia as a mafia state, and so you have to judge it through uh, the lens of mafia rules. And I get the distinct impression that Prigozhin was Putin's praetorian prefect. He was there to protect him uh, against the military and other factions in the Kremlin. And somehow Prigozhin got it into his mind that actually factions in the, uh, in the Kremlin had taken over control of operations and decisions. Uh, and I'll say to you now that I think uh, Putin uh, has actually lost power in the Kremlin. It's not as a result of this action. I think he'd lost it beforehand. Uh, Prigozhin detected that. Uh, and believe it or not, Prigozhin was projecting the line that he was going to save Putin from sort of evil counsellors. Uh, and this is a familiar pattern in Russian history. And I think the march on Moscow was not against Putin as such, but against, yeah. I think, the people that are likely to succeed Putin and are manoeuvring around him even now. I don't think Putin is in control anymore. I think uh, the factions that seek to take over from him are in control. And he was put out in front to deal with Prigozhin. And I think we'll see that dynamic play out. Putin's yeah. finished now. And I think he's just a puppet, uh, rather like another superpower, in fact. Well, that's interesting that you say that, Chris, because uh, I know yesterday you were, you were actually saying that time is running out for him, he is finished, and I wonder, Tobias Elwood, whether or not you would agree with that. I mean, do you... Th I mean, he is a hard man. He has got this hard man image in his own country, but yesterday he looked very shaken, didn't he? And he's, as we understand it, a man who um, is very quick to hold a grudge and also very quick to punish people. Do you think he's now going to have to do something really very unconventional to get back that hard man image. Uh, yes, certainly. I would agree with Chris Philly there. And we should expect the unconventional. It, we're in a very difficult, unpredictable mm. period. The mutiny has been diffused, but it is a game changer. Yes, the Wagner group has been neutered, uh, Prigozhin, its leader, exiled. But Putin emerges significantly weaker. And the folly and the cost of this Ukrainian war has now been exposed to the Russian public that usually get a diet of state news. Russia will now enter a darker chapter because Putin has tried to learn from his own history to make Moscow coup d'etat proof, if you like. Mm -hmm. He's likely to clamp down heavily on security. He'll hunt, hunt out dissenters. But Russian history shows it's, it's often the first wound that may not look decisive, but it triggers a series of uh, catastrophic events. And so I would agree, uh, Putin is no longer in control. He relies heavily on that hard man reputation. Mm -hmm. And in 23 years of power, his vulnerability has been exposed. 
How, con how concerned were you, um, as uh, in the role that you have as chair of the Defence Committee, um, knowing that Britain has got a very strong relationship with Ukraine and has really been at the forefront of all the, the, the hardware that we provided them to, to fight this war against Russia? How concerned were, the, were you yesterday that the leader of another NATO country, Erdogan in Turkey, was the first man to pick up the telephone and actually congratulate Putin on what had happened yesterday, um, effectively saying, you know, well done? <laughs> Well, uh, Erdogan's uh, comments uh, aren't out of character. Don't forget, he and indeed Hungary have denied Sweden and Finland from uh, mm -hmm. swift entry uh, into NATO. Sweden's still not a member. I mean, from Ukraine's perspective, let's just digest that for a second. You know, Russian leaders are in disagreement, distracted, even fighting amongst each other. The orders are not getting through to the Ukrainian front line. That's clear. Morale of the Russian soldier, already low, will continue to ebb. And Putin has lost uh, the ability of his most elite force to operate as part of his land combat formations in Ukraine. So there's clearly an opportunity for Ukraine to exploit this unprecedented turn of events. I'm absolutely right. Ukraine should not hesitate. But it would be wrong for the international community to then to get involved in, this, in any of this. We have to work with Russia uh, post-Putin. We have to work with Russia to find the necessary off-ramps that allow us you know, in the decades to follow, uh, to come to some form of accommodation. So how we act, what we do in the next days and weeks and so forth, will be absolutely critical here. Yeah, Chris, let's talk about that force, the Wagner force, because they were reckoned to be the elite troops. I know they were a kind of ragtag group, a bunch of misfits on the whole, people out of prison and goodness knows what else. But they were thought to be the elite troop, the, the really force to be reckoned with. Um, but um, Prigozhin was saying that the, the, um, the army was using them as cannon fodder, and that was what he was objecting to. Now, he's going to go to Belarus. He's, he's been sent off there. He's not going to be leading his men anymore. Those men are now apparently going to be integrated into the Russian army, the very army that Prigozhin was saying is not being used properly. What effect do you think this is now going to have on those forces? Are they going to be prepared now they've lost the man who was their, their leader? Are they going to now be subjected to all the, 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 the problems that Prigozhin was mentioning in terms of the way that the army and the, in fact the, the entire um, event in Yugoslavia is being handled. In Ukraine, you mean? I'm mm. oh, yeah. sorry, in Ukraine. My apologies. Yes. <laughs> if we're going for Yugoslavia, we need to worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, there's quite a few questions there. Um, I think, first of all, Angela, we've got to understand they're not an elite force. They're a shock force, uh, and they achieve that by using maximum violence and not really obeying the rules of, of war. Um, you know, it's a pretty nasty outfit, and uh, they, they get their way simply by being more violent and more ruthless than any other unit can be. Um, even the, the Russian army is frightened of them. When Prigozhin said, look, you know, we'll, ki we'll kill and destroy anything that gets in our way, most Russians would have believed that. Um, so that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, Prig Prigozhin is the political figurehead of Wagner. He's also the CEO. Uh, the generals who actually run the Wagner group are still in place, uh, and they will be there, obviously, defending their corner. Um, the, the issue of, I, I can't stress enough, Angela, that, the, that Prigozhin and the Wagner Group are now facing whoever are the factions who are taking over from Putin now. This is not a Putin issue. And, it, and one of the things we have to prepare ourselves for now is dealing with a very disparate, uh, very divided Kremlin. I, I don't believe Putin is actually making the decisions, uh, and that is really dangerous. And so anything to do with Ukraine right now, we're going to have to identify who the power brokers are. And I keep saying to people, if you've seen the film The Death of Stalin, this is what is going on in the Kremlin at the moment. All the cultural uh, in, infighting uh, uh, is taking place. And Prigozhin, I think, saw that. And his, his, his revolt was against that rather than Putin himself. Indeed, that's what he said. Uh, and we've got to listen to that. And one of those factions was the Russian army under Shoigu and Gerasimov. Uh, so we've got to see how the pieces are moving on the board right now, but we shouldn't be under any, any illusions. Putin is not in control. You were nodding your head in agreement there, Tobias. I mean, we, we think that Putin is perhaps um, now... The hyenas are circling around him, aren't they? They certainly are. What are we going to think, very briefly, is going to happen to Prigozhin himself? He's been um, exiled now to Belarus. I mean, is he a marked man? Is he going to be another one that's going to fall out of a window somewhere or get poisoned by an umbrella? What's his future? 
<laughs> yeah, I, they obviously, I think he's going to be <laughs> going to be very careful what he eats and where he goes and so forth. But uh, I think the focus has to be on 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 Putin. He relies on his own credibility, his own legitimacy. Uh, he relies heavily on the loyalty of sec of his security apparatus. And he relies on the ability to throw large sums of money and resources at any problem, whatever the cost, including life. And in all three of those areas, you know, that he's been seriously weakened. The streets of Moscow having to be defended by tank regiments, his mo most loyal, most competent, as Chris says, most violent force has now turned on him. And of course, those sanctions are starting to bite uh, and uh, affecting the Kremlin's coffers. So, uh, you know, we see this. Uh, the death of Stalin is, uh, you know, wise to be watched, I think, again. Russia traditionally likes strong leaders to hold the motherland, the complex, disparate motherland together to protect it. But when a leader loses popularity amongst the elites or demonstrates weakness, as history shows, the Kremlin can be very swift and ruthless to replace them. But in this mm -hmm. case, it is complicated because there's an awful lot of people have been waiting for this moment, unimpressed by what's going on in Ukraine, seeing that Putin's stock after being so high, after holding the country together after this collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, is clearly on its way out. Yeah, well, I'm going to be talking to somebody, one of the Ukrainian um, ministers a bit later on in the programme. But in the meantime, Chris and Tobias, thank you both very much indeed for that. Now, stay with us, because in just a few minutes, I'm going to be speaking to a woman who almost took a trip to the Titanic wreck aboard that ill-fated Titan submersible. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. 
Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, more than a century after the stricken Titanic went down in the North Atlantic, the luxury cruise liner continues to cast its deathly shadow. Over the last week, we were gripped by the hunt for a submersible carrying five men to explore the Titanic's wreck 12,000 feet under the ocean. We were told the exploration company, Ocean Gate, who developed the vessel, had lost contact with it, but that there was enough oxygen to last 96 hours. Well, as we now know, that, as it turned out, was a fantasy. The submersible had been destroyed by a catastrophic implosion with the loss of all aboard, including 19-year-old Suleiman Daywood. Well, Julie Cook has spent years writing about the Titanic, including her book, Titanic and the City of Widows It Left Behind. Her great-grandfather was actually a stoker on the ship and went down with it in 1912, and she joins me in the studio now. You have such a very personal connection to this ship. What on earth made you want to go down and take a look at it? Because you were given that opportunity, weren't I you? It was. Great question. Yes. I mean, as a, as a person, I've never wanted to go down to it. But as a journalist, I was approached in 2021 by an American uh, production company who said, look, you're, you've written this book, you're a descendant. My great-grandfather was a stoker on the Titanic. Come down, come down with this presenter, see the see the ship, talk about it, and talk about your personal connection. Uh, so, as as journalists, we do, don't we? We agree mm. to do things, and um, I said yes. It was quite embryonic stages. We were talking about the times and when we'd go and what it would be like on board. Uh, so, I was nervous. I'm not into you know small spaces or anything like that, and it would have been a seven hour trip all round. Uh, but yes, I did agree. But I did have my misgivings. What were they? My misgivings were really naive ones, actually, at the time. I never, it never crossed my mind anything like this could happen. My misgivings were, will I feel claustrophobic? You know, how do you go to the loo? Um, things like that, really sort of inane, innocuous things, which actually now I think I was very naive not to think more about. It didn't occur to you that actually the whole thing was sort of held together with string and sealing wax, as we discovered ultimately? No, it wasn't. Uh, they had a very um, a polished website. You know, they, they, they are and were, um, and the remaining members members of Ocean Gate are very top of their game, they're very experienced. Uh, and so you put your trust in these people. When people are uh, great in what they do, you do put your trust in them, again, perhaps naively. Um, and, and the actual design of the, uh, the device, I believe, was helped or des designed by NASA, although they're, I think, stepping away from that now. Uh, but yeah, I had no idea it was, it was a sort of um, botched, perhaps, as we are now hearing. Yeah, but you got out of it because uh, you were told that there were problems with visas and yes. everything else. And so, basically, the people who got you out of that saved your life. I mean, is that how you look at it now? Yes. I, I mean, at the time, those, those two initial, I think, ones that year were successful. So, in a way, if I had gone, perhaps it would have been all right. Mm. But, as you say... It, it could have been so different now, now that we see what happened to that. Does that make you feel place. sick to your yes, when I you realise that's, that's <laughs> yes. what might have happened? Yes, I felt sick all week. I, you know, sick for them, worried for them, worried for the five on board, particularly the young 19-year-old. Um, th there's a Titanic community as well of us descendants and people mm -hmm. in, uh, interested in, in Ocean Gate. And we, our, our paths do cross sort of so on social media and, and all of that. So, yeah, very worried about people who, who I knew through people were on board. Uh, but now, yes, feeling like you've escaped something yourself, really. Mm. Um, it, yeah. I mean, it's not the only ship that's ever sunk in rather dramatic circumstances. What is it about the Titanic that gives it this sort of myth that people want to go and see it? What, what is it about it? I agree. Uh, there's been the Lusitania, hasn't there, which was a, yeah. a huge disaster here on our shores, mm -hmm. uh, which hasn't garnered the same interest. Um, I think the Titanic was... Because it was such a beautiful ship, it was such an opulent ship, and it had the big names of the day. It's like every big name you know today being on one ship. You know, it had Guggenheim, Molly Brown, um, all these bigwigs of the day, Jacob Astor. Mm -hmm. And if you imagine all those people either surviving or dying in one big event, 
and that happening today with people we know of today, it would be huge. Um, I think it also represented the end of an era. You know, we talk about before First World War and post First World War. I think we can talk about pre-Titanic and post-Titanic. It was a microcosm of society in all the levels on the ship, you first class, second class, the immigrants who wanted to have a better life, the people in the bottom, my great-grandfather, a stoker, the very mm -hmm. poor. Um, and I think it represented all of that in one big ship. And when that went down, life was never the same afterwards. Yes. I mean, do you, do you feel that this particular disaster now has made people consider whether or not we should actually be treating the wreck of the Titanic as, as, a, as a kind of tourist attraction, that it's a, an adventure playground for people who have the money and the opportunity to do it, that we should stop all of that now? Yes, I do. I do. I think it should stop. I think if ever a sign were needed that this should stop, it's, it's this. Uh, I, I disagree with people who say, oh, but it's... it's um, exploration of under, undersea, it's exploration. It's not. It's just people going to see the Titanic. It, you know, you can explore the erosion and the decay of the ship with ROVs, you know, the, the, the yes. unmanned um, mm. equipment, or, you know, through other ways. We don't need to be sending people down. I'm not judging the people who chose to go. They were explorers, brave explorers, and, and perhaps there are many people who would still have liked to have done that, obviously not with the, the outcome. Um, but I do think now's the time to leave it be. It's, it's a resting place and it is a grave. Yeah. Julie, thank you very much indeed thank for joining you. us. And we are glad that you are able to. Yes. And to be in one piece. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Now, I don't need to tell many of you at home just how concerned some people are by their mortgage repayments right now. Anyone whose fixed term comes to an end the next year or so is likely to see a very big hike in their repayments after the Bank of England raised the base rate to 5%. Now, we know it's going to be painful, but just how painful? Well, to help us answer that question, I'm joined now by mortgage broker Sally Mitchell from The Mortgage Mum and The Economist Vicky Price, good morning and welcome to both of you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Vicky, can I just start with you, please? Because I have a feeling that the Bank of England, the government, economists in general, they are, are very good at blinding us all with charts and justification for the things that they do. But actually, when it comes down to it, this is how what they do affects real people and it's going to be bad, isn't it? Absolutely. And the interesting thing is that the Bank of England raised rates by 50 basis points. In other words, not just by the quarter of a percent that we all thought, but by the 50 percent, which um, in a way calmed the markets um, because they had anticipated anyway that there could possibly be, because of the inflation uh, rate recalculations that were taking place, we're going to have higher inflation, therefore interest rates had to be higher. They anticipated another four uh, quarter point increases at least. So the Bank of England you know, moved in quickly, at least this time it did. And uh, the markets have uh, sort of not necessarily you know, raised all the other rates uh, you know, as much as perhaps you would have thought. But in fact, they've come down a bit and even sterling has come down a bit. And the reason for that is they think that this is actually a very serious move. It is going to affect lots of people, just as you're suggesting. And therefore, it is the likelihood of recession has come closer and that's why in fact the markets are now repricing what's going to happen next so they're quite pessimistic about the uk economy and i think this interest rate increase sort of more or less confirms it are they pessimistic about it because i've read uh, sally reports that say that this is not the end of the pain that in fact we could go up as high as six yeah that's what i've been told and what i've what i've read we're certainly not out of the woods yet um, and of course, you know, anything that, that happens with the interest rate, it takes a while for that to actually trickle down. Mm. You know, there are people who are coming to the end of their fixed rates in the next six months or year who are going to be affected. So um, I was talking to someone literally five minutes ago who said their rate doesn't end for two years, but they're already worried because they're looking at changing from a 1.9%, which they can just about afford, to, you know, Six, six point one nine at the moment, the average, and perhaps in six months or a year, it's going to be more than that. It is indeed. And I mean, one of the things that I heard an economist say earlier this this past week was um, that the bank has got to learn from the mistakes that it's made in the past. I have to say that uh, that set alarm bells ringing for me. Uh, does that suggest to you that perhaps the Bank of England and indeed the government in general has been a bit cavalier with what they're doing with interest rates and how they're playing with the, trying to keep inflation down but putting interest rates up and have not really thought out what effect this is going to have on the general public? I don't know who you're asking, but well, I can Sally, jump in if you like. Would you like to answer? Yes. Well, 
I'm, I'm so sorry. That did feel like an economist's question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I have seen the headlines of the plank of England, and I think when when it all hits the fan, it's very easy to point fingers and and blame. Certainly, the way, and I'm sure Vicky will will probably concur. I hope that we try and, and control inflation is by raising interest rates. Mm. And they say if it's not hurting, it's not working. Well, it's certainly hurting people. Uh, we have seen inflation come down, not as quickly. It's not coming down as quickly as they hoped. That spooked the market um, a month ago. Um, but you know, if the idea is to stop people spending and to cut money supply down, then that is exactly what is happening. So in a weird sort of economic way it's it's working but of course it's so hard for the people on the on the receiving end yeah, but, um, vicky will you please pick up that answer then because as i say it did set alarm bells ringing for me if they're talking about learning from the mistakes that they've made in the past they've been doing this yo-yoing with with mortgage rates and everything else for years now what lessons do they have to learn that they shouldn't already have learned well, it's interesting because when you look at what the Bank of England has done, in fact, it raised interest rates before it started raising interest rates after everyone reduced their rates, the central banks, because of COVID, uh, earlier than the US, earlier than the European Central Bank. So actually, you could argue that they were on top of the situation. And of course, at the time, we still didn't know how uh, important and in the increases for energy costs were going to be on both businesses and the consumer. Um, but the interesting thing is that interest rates are uh, almost as high now as they are in the US, and the US has seen a drop in inflation, almost a halving in inflation. We haven't seen that. Uh, the European Central Bank only started raising rates last July. It was still negative as of last July, which is extraordinary, their main deposit rate. And uh, and yet their inflation there is also a lot more manageable. So here, there you have places like Spain with only 3% inflation, for example. Uh, you have France at 5%. So there is something wrong in terms of the structure of the economy, I think, uh, which is making the job of the Bank of England much more difficult. First of all, we've lost lots and lots of workers. In the areas where inflation is happening, such as the service sector, it's in uh, places like um, entertainment, it's hospitality, it's retail, it's tourism. And those are the areas where EU workers were very prominent. They're not there anymore. So staff costs are going up. But if you look at services overall, what you see is that input prices, apart from staff, are really falling now. They're slowing down and also almost falling in some areas such as petrol and everything else, energy. Uh, it's staff where the issues are and they're passing it on, of course, to, to the consumer. There is one other very quick thing that I can mention on this, which is that we stepped in so late to support energy mm. costs for, for, for individuals. We stepped in late for businesses. We've done very little on the food price front. What has happened yeah. across Europe is completely different. And I think we have encouraged inflation expectations to be high, hence wage demands, strikes and everything else of the sort that we don't see in other countries. Yeah, indeed. I mean, very briefly, I wonder when um, we're talking about this being the highest rate, um, rate for 15 years, whether or not we actually just all got used to having cheap money. And we now have to accept that the banks are saying that actually we cannot run the economy and we cannot run banks on 0% or 1%. We have to put up the increase. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see those, I call them COVID rates, um, again for a very, very long time, if ever. Um, the new norm, I believe, in a couple of years will be about 4.5% for borrowing, um, for mortgages, certainly. And what we've got to remember, although you know it's, it's the highest rate for 15 years, um, but we borrowed less money back then. I remember it being you know, 13 14% easily, but we were borrowing twice our incomes, our annual incomes for mortgages. These days, we're borrowing 4.5 as a minimum. So it's it feels, although it's only 5%, it does feel like it's 13% to the people who you know, are sitting in their homes, wondering how on earth they're going to pay it. Yes, as you say, cheap money, a thing of the past. Thank you both very yeah. much indeed for joining us today. Thank you, Vicky and Sally Mitchell. Thank you. Now, this week, the BBC news broadcaster Clive Myrie was um, shunted off the news at 10 on Friday after immediately appearing in the programme before as chairman of Have I Got News For You. Now, Clive had been scheduled to present the news immediately after that comedy panel show aired, a show in which he did poke fun at Boris Johnson and made other rather highly political jokes and comments. Well, apparently, BBC leadership was so concerned about accusations of BBC bias, um, they took him off. So, 
would it be better if newscasters just avoided comedy shows altogether? Well, I'm joined now by two of GB News' own com comedy panellists and presenters from Headliners and Free Speech Nation. It's Steve N. Allen and Leo Curse. Good morning. Oh, is it good? Yes, it is still good morning, isn't it? Good morning to both of you, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Um, I mean, did, did either did you both see the program? I mean, I need to know that to start with. Yeah. No, they I did. didn't. I didn't watch it because I, I don't pay my license fee, so I, I don't want them coming around and saying like, "Oh, but listen, you watched five minutes of Have I Got News for You?" So oh. yeah, not for me. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't be admitting it's that to live on air. <laughs> but now look, traditionally, and I'm and I'm speaking from experience here, obviously. Traditionally, news readers do not make political comments. They are broadcasters, they're not pundits, and that way they can never be accused of political bias. So do you think that Clive actually made the right decision going on the programme in the first place? Definitely, yeah. yeah I think it's, I think it's, of course. He was, he was you're, a great you're host, though. I think, I don't know why people are oversensitive. He was reading out jokes that he hadn't written in the same way that he reads out the news that he hadn't written. Why are people getting offended? <laughs> Well, the BBC executives obviously got offended by it. What, what, what do you think, Steve? Yeah, I, 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 I think we're being too sensitive. Or... Sorry, which one's going to talk next? Leo. Leon. Go for it, Leo. All right. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Leon, do you, uh, so, yeah, I mean, is, do you think the BBC is being oversensitive? So, uh, I mean, really, they've created this this problem themselves. If they just had enough representation on their on their stupid shows, the comedy shows and stuff. I mean, I, I did I did a little analysis. Steve will probably disagree with of, uh, of comedians that have an overt political position on BBC comedy shows. Ninety eight percent are left wing, and two percent are Jeff Norcott. It's ridiculous, you know, considering they, they want, you know, the half of the country that is right wing to continue paying the licence fee, there's, there's no representation there. Uh, so they, they could just avoid all this controversy by just having some right wing people on their shows to start off with. And doing, you know, taking taking some guy who's been on Have I Got News For You, taking him off uh, off a news show, it's it's like a, it's like a sort of virtue signal. It's it's a sort of like high profile, like oh look, we've done something. It's like you haven't you haven't done anything. You've just you know this is one tiny little token gesture. The underlying problem of a lack of representation is still there across across all the BBC, and that's why I, as as a conservative, I, I don't feel that I can possibly be justified in paying my license fee uh, because I'm not represented in their comedy shows. Do do you agree with that, Steve? Do you feel that there's there's not proper representation? I think there's a there's a greater pool of of, uh, of left wing comedians that are being used. However, what we're talking about here is a newsreader being removed who actually doesn't show bias. Reading out in the first section where they talked about Boris Johnson, there were jokes about Labour Party. There was a joke where the the and it's very much punching down the Lib Dems with a punchline. You've got to feel sorry for those three people. So it. it was more balanced than it looks if you don't watch the show, but you just read it in the newspapers. And again, if there isn't a worry about being perceived to have an anti-Tory bias, I don't think any... I mean, on this, I agree with Leo. Nothing was changed by having a newsreader not read the news later that day. Yeah, but... but is it not, as far as the BBC were concerned, in the eyes of the public it could have been? I mean, Clive, as you say, did not actually write the script himself. But even when he was saying some of the jokes, the other panellists were, were commenting on the fact that this was likely to have an effect on his career, saying, oh, you want to have a new career then, do you, Clive? And then, oh, you won't be on Bake Off now, and then ended up by saying, well, that's BBC Cornwall gone as well. I mean, even they on the panel <laughs> realised <laughs> realized that there was a problem with a BBC news reader actually being political. But they Steve. shouldn't yeah. be, because yeah, the, the presumption is then that someone sat at home and they can't tell the difference. That, that's that's um, presuming that the audience is so stupid they think, wait a minute, this man's face has done a joke about Boris Johnson, therefore we know all of his political bias and he won't be able to stop that bias changing the news he reads out from an auto cue. None of that makes sense. So this sensitivity, this hypersensitivity, doesn't help anyone, because surely no one's actually well, that just silly Steve, if you think, oh, that, that's, rid that's, that's ridiculous. Happens, you know? So would, would you, Steve, would you be happy, would you be happy if, uh, say, a BBC newsreader uh, marched in a Ku Klux Klan rally? Because, uh, hey, it's just what they're doing in their personal time. It's just his personal opinions. Nobody thinks that he's going to bring that bias to the news. 
But isn't there also got, a question here over the scheduling and, and that the maybe this was a slam, problem? The idea of I'm sorry. having someone like Andrew Neil talking about or tweeting about his view on Brexit, I'd still trust him to interview all the politicians, which he did from an impartial point of view. So there's a great example of someone who can show that they have a bias, but don't use it at work because they've got oh. the ability not to. But you just... But he- He's but you just said, reader, Steve, you just said that uh, the uh, newsreaders aren't writing, they're just reading out a script, they're reading out the news that, that happens. And then you make the, the very good point that uh, actually newsreaders uh, do bring their insight and their angles to when they're interviewing people. Can, can I yeah. just make so the point what, that I think was, here, perhaps, sorry. guys, <laughs> that this, the problem might have been just purely in scheduling, that actually the people who were the producers of How I Got News For You didn't talk to the people who were producing the news, and that the problem that they saw was that there was Clive Myrie's face for an hour or whatever doing Have I Got News For You and making political jokes, and then immediately afterwards, there he was reading the 10 o'clock news. Was it not right that it was not that he was shunted off at the last minute, because apparently the, the newsreader was actually parachuted in very much the last minute to replace him, that actually they should have just talked to each other and not had that uh, that clash in the first place. S- Stuart, yeah, Steve, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get that kind of scheduling oh, yeah. mess up on GB News, uh, although I am on Free Speech Nation and Headliners later on. Uh, but don't worry, I'll, be, I'll definitely be bringing the exact same bias to every single show. <laughs> and I'm sure you will be too, Steve. <laughs> the, I bring no bias. I'm entirely impartial. Just in case. <laughs> But you're both very funny men, and it was a pleasure to have you on the programme. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. That was uh, Steve Allen and uh, Leo Kers there. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to have uh, Stefan Kariasis' view uh, with news about what's lighting up the West End this week. So stay with us. Like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides have the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching.
You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now, who would have thought when he was appointed as England football manager that Gareth Southgate would be the subject of a musical? <laughs> well, Dear England opened on Tuesday at the National Theatre and it's hit the back of the net with most <laughs> of the critics. And our very own Stefan Kariasis was among them. What did you like about it? I mean, first of all, how can you make a musical about it's... the manager of an England football team? <laughs> It's not a musical. So. It's not a musical? <laughs> no, it's not. We've got other musicals. The next, oh. two, the next two shows are musicals. They told me that this, one was a musical. No, this one, there's no singing in this one. There's lots <laughs> oh, of, there's lots of football. Um, yeah. I was still there. I was very much like, I'm, I'm not a massive football fan. And yeah. I'm like, why are we bringing football into my theatre? Yeah. But football is theatre. Audiences, crowds, the highs, the lows, the drama, the, you know, the yeah. acting when they take tackles and, and fouls. Um, but actually, it's it's number one. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's wonderfully written. It's James Graham who recently wrote Best of Enemies, and that was about politics. Yeah. But it was about the clash between the ideas of Gore Vidal and William Buckley. So he's very much about ideas, and he's about social ideas, society, how things change, how we look at things, and how we ourselves behave in response. And it's filled. There's so much going on in this, and it's also thrillingly done. They they reenact penalties. And I was with a girlfriend, and we know nothing about football, so we actually didn't know what was going to happen. So we were like, oh, what's good, you know. And, <laughs> and, and, but also, there must have been a lot of people that did know. There was cheering in the audience. Really? Um, because he has, an, he has early triumphs. Yeah. So it's very much like we had this penalties curse. Um, and so he went into the World Cup in 2018 um, telling the team, we're not going to win. And this is the revolutionary idea of... England, nationhood, sense of identity, pride, hubris. Mm -hmm. Why do we assume we are still the greatest? We're entitled, we should win. It's a crippling pressure. It's almost impossible. We have a terrible track record in, in national, international competitions. So he just, he wanted to release some of that for the players and also little by little, it appears, somewhat for the nation. So it's a sort of theatrical biography of the man. But I mean, football, I know, what about football, what you could put on that fingernail? Um, but, I mean, it's played on a big pitch mm. with a lot of people. Mm. How do you transfer that? I mean, even when they're training, even when he's talking to them in, 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 mm. in, in their, their rooms, um, how do they transfer that to a theatrical performance? It's fantastically staged. Es Devlin is the kind of theatrical sort of staging creator. Um, she's worked on the Super Bowl. She's the one that put the Lehman trilogy famously into a glass yeah. box on stage. She's incredibly visual. It's very simple staging. There's just these two hovering discs of light when you come in, almost kind of sci-fi, and then they raise and lower, and then you have the open-air ceiling of a stadium illuminated above you. Wraparound screens bring in the crowds, but they also flash up all the scores and everything. Yeah. They, they, they so it's visually very exciting. Visually exciting. They mime taking the penalties, but all the results kind of flash up on giant screens. There's crowd noises, there's pumping music like you're in a stadium. It's thrilling. You also have a phenomenal performance by Joseph Fiennes, who we think of as billowing shirts, yeah, charismatic, yeah. posh and charming costume dramas. And he disappears into the skin of this very diffident, quiet man. He's playing Gareth. He's playing Gareth yeah. Southgate. It's a wonderful, wonderful show. Um, but it's very much about national pride, masculinity, yeah. and our behaviour as audiences, as fans, what we put them through. The Dear England letter that Southgate wrote himself before the Euros, I think, uh, Euros 2020, yes. was to remind the country that these players are fans yeah. and people. 
and that discussions of colour of skin and other things are unacceptable. Is he? I mean, he has had a very interesting mm. uh, role, and and he's brought very very new ideas very. to being the, the manager yeah. of the England football team. So you don't have to be a football fan to want no, to. No, not at it. all. Because no. these brought ideas that are about us, about people, about yeah. human beings, and being a better person. Oh, I like the idea actually of going to the theatre and being able to behave like a football crowd. It's wonderful. Providing we haven't got the violence and the... And no, the well, this is yeah, the we point. We're that. growing beyond that, Angela. <laughs> and this is partly, hugely due to this one man, yeah. which I didn't know. I found it inspiring. Oh, great. I loved okay. it. Now, the, the, um, the one you do want to talk about, which is a musical... It is a is musical. ...is Mrs Doubtfire. Now, yes. this, as far as I'm concerned, this was a perfectly good book. Yes. And actually, it was a perfectly good film with Robin yes. Williams, wasn't it? Yes. Playing Mrs Doubtfire, a man playing a woman. Yes. How does that transfer to the stage? Well, firstly, your point here is the same that most of us, including me, are making. The book itself of the musical is also rather good. The music is not so good, unfortunately, which lets it down greatly. The central performance is great. We have this issue of a man playing a woman, and there have been some trying to turn it into a man playing a woman to get access to children, trying to make some big drama out of it. Um, it depends on how it's done, I would yeah. say, in my opinion. If you're just playing it for the, the hilarity, the ridiculousness of, oh, let's snigger at a man dressed as a woman, that is no longer... Well, they've been doing that in pantomime with pantomime dames for, for centuries. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the reasoning behind it. I don't yeah. think it's acceptable anymore to laugh mm. just purely because it's a man in a dress. Some yeah. men might want to wear dresses. And also, it's the why. This is very much the humorous situational. It's his own... It's Daniel, the character's ridiculous mess-ups and falling-overs and burning the food and putting sort of cream on his face and, and all of this. So it's, it's the silliness. It's very good-hearted. It's very much about family. So it works on all those levels. Um, whether it's needed, I don't think so. I think it's, it was a perfectly great film. Um, and a perfectly good book for, yes. for young people. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, and the show also works like that. But there are a lot of, there are a lot of better adaptations. Yeah. The Groundhog Day at the moment is a wonderful musical. Back to the Future is a sensational musical. It can be done. Robin Hood? Musical? Yeah, this is a Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. Now, you would think, it's a, it's, if you haven't been, it's one of the most glorious venues. Yeah, the have, whole park yeah. wraps around Fabulous. you. You're in here, you're in the trees yeah. for Robin Hood. I, I was really hoping this would be wonderful. It's just not. It's, it's, it's billed as rewritten and reimagined. Um, so it has a much more kind of supposedly radical feminist slant. Marion's role has changed quite considerably. <laughs> but that's been done through films and yeah. through books previously. It wants to talk about social issues. That was in Robin Hood hundreds of years ago. So I don't find it terribly radical. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's just too amateur this time. It's mm. a wonderful, stunning venue. I've seen some incredible productions there. This one, for me, didn't yeah. work. You know what bothers me is no how many musicals we have in the West End and how many people think that if you're going to have a new production, let's make a musical. And I, I, I was looking back at some of the musicals of the mm. past, like Phantom, Saigon, mm. Les Mis, even further back, Carousel, South Pacific, um, Oklahoma, Crazy For You, Pajama Glame. These are all fabulous musicals that have stood the test of time because they are chock full of fab songs. Yes. Too do we think that too many people are just producing a musical because they think it's a, it's a great way of making money, of putting something on the stage, but actually the content does not live up to those classics? There's an element of that, but I would also ask you to remember that in all those years and decades, there were endless flops, there were <laughs> endless failures. We remember the good stuff. Yeah. There were lots and lots and lots that didn't. So this is the cream that we remember, and that's the natural progress yeah. of things. Have we got cream at the moment? We have a lot of cream at the moment. There's a tiny little musical based on Benjamin Button that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. There's Operation Mincemeat, which is based on the World War II true story. Yes. That is now the best reviewed show in London history. It's spectacular. It's one of the best shows I've ever seen. There are some truly, often to be said, smaller shows where real creativity and artistry and love comes in. So, yes, Angela, I disagree. You disagree. Well, we'll we will agree. Go and see a musical. I have to say, that's uh, all we've got for the first half. <laughs> Gosh, it's been packed, hasn't it? But we'll be back in a few minutes with lots more, including the legendary Kiki D. Hello there. I'm Jonathan Vautry, here with your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is certainly going to be a hot day for some of us. Southerly winds 
feeding up, bringing in this heat, particularly for southern and eastern areas of England. But for others, it'll be a bit more unsettled, this low pressure centre bringing this cold front across Northern Ireland first thing this morning and will gradually bring some heavy outbreaks of rain to Scotland's northern England and into parts of northern Wales as well. Chance that some thunderstorms bubble up across parts of Lincolnshire up into Yorkshire and Northumberland. Some heavy rain still across Aberdeenshire into Orkney as well. Eastern areas of Northern Ireland also seeing some heavy showers this afternoon as well. Further to the south, staying dry, but that heat really building, climbing towards 32 Celsius. Really quite humid as well, feeling sticky. It's going to be a blustery day for many of us, though, and it will continue to be breezy for those eastern areas as that rain eventually clears its way off. But it should turn drier for many of us overnight, just a scattering of showers lingering in the far north and west. Underneath those clear spells, though, temperatures will be dropping lower compared to last night. And with fresher winds as well, it means that it's not going to feel as hot and humid for us. So generally around 12, 14 degrees Celsius as your minimums for Monday morning. And then it starts off the new working week on a bright note. Plenty of sunshine first thing. The showers, though, bubbling up, particularly across the northern half of the UK. Those could be locally heavy with maybe still some thunder in the mixture. But they'll be moving through fairly quickly on a moderate breeze. Again, further towards the south, you're more likely to stay dry, but noticeably fresher and a bit cooler. Highs around 25 degrees Celsius. Any sunshine throughout the evening will tend to be hazy at times as the cloud builds its way in from the west, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland ahead of this rain that is moving its way in for the overnight period and into Tuesday. And there's further spells of showers and rain for us as we head towards the middle part of the week. Temperatures, though, holding up just around where they should be. Enjoy your day. Bye bye. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting, they're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion. Looking at the week before, and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From six is Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. 
Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com? You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Sunday with Michael Portillo, but just to confuse you, it's not Michael this week, it's me, Angela Rippon. I'm filling in for him and um, I hope I've got another packed hour for you. Well, Russia is still heading up our news agenda today and we are going to be asking what the latest developments actually mean for Ukraine, where most of the Russian army is still trying to hold back a Ukrainian counteroffensive. We're going to talk politics as the DUP have been in the papers this morning because they've said that uh, this is what it's going to take for them to re-enter the Stormont executive in Northern Ireland. And, um, sorry Rishi, but uh, it does involve a complete overhaul of the Windsor framework, which you negotiated with the EU. The DUP is calling for a system of what they're calling mutual enforcement that could finally be resolving what is happening in the Brexit saga. Also, a new survey suggesting that women who hit middle age are increasingly throwing caution to the wind and exploring their adventurous side. Well, we're going to chat to a traveller and author, Alice Morrison, to find out um, what's going on. And speaking of women with adventurous lives, we are delighted to be joined later by the legendary pop performer Kiki D, who has been making music for the past six decades. She's got lots of story for us and uh, that's all to come. But first, here are your latest news headlines. Angela, thank you very much. This is the latest from the GB newsroom. The Kremlin says the criminal charges against the leader of the Wagner mercenary group will be dropped and he'll go to Belarus. Wagner fighters started to return to their bases after Yevgeny Prigozhin ordered them last night to turn back from Moscow to avoid bloodshed. They were on the way to the city to remove Russian commanders that Prigozhin blames for mishandling the war in Ukraine. Local media has reported that all transport restrictions in the Rostov region have now been lifted. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he's in touch with allies about the armed rebellion. As I said, we've been monitoring for a while the potential of Russia's in illegal invasion in Ukraine to be destabilizing. And that's obviously this, you've seen the situation as it's developing. We're keeping a close eye on that. We're in touch with our allies as the situation evolves. I'll be speaking to some of them later today. And the most important thing is for all parties to behave responsibility, responsibly and to protect civilian lives. The Prime Minister has set out what he's calling the biggest workforce training expansion of the NHS. Writing in the Sunday Times, Mr Sunak said his NHS long-term workforce plan will aim to train, retain and reform the UK's experienced NHS staff. He says as a country we rely on attracting talented people from overseas rather than recruiting at home. Mr Sunak described the 15-year plan as the cornerstone of the government's vision for a better healthcare system. The Chancellor says raising interest rates is one of the most effective methods to curb inflation. This week, interest rates were hiked up to 5% from 4.5%, the 13th rate rise in a row and the sharpest increase since February. The move means mortgage holders are preparing for a big jump in their monthly repayments. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Jeremy Hunt is urging those struggling to be patient with the painful measures. Chief Secretary to the Treasury John Glenn told GB News the Chancellor is committed committed to supporting the Bank of England. As you know, the Bank of England is independent of government. We work closely with them, but they make those decisions and they've obviously increased our rates by half a percent last week. I'm not here to commentate. I'm here to work closely with the Bank of England. People uh, don't want us to be uh, squabbling amongst ourselves. What we should be doing is having a committed and united plan to deal with high inflation in our economy. That is what we're doing in government, and that is what the Governor of the Bank of England is doing with the interest rate decisions. 
Human remains have been found where British actor Julian Sands went missing in the area of the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles. They've been transported to the local coroner's office pending positive identification. It's expected that should be completed next week. The 65-year-old failed to return from a hike in the Mount Baldy area of the Southern Californian Mountains on the 13th of January. Now, here in the UK, all state secondary schools in England are now equipped with a defibrillator. The government says secondary schools received priority because of the risk of cardiac arrest increasing with age. The Department for Health says the device will also be rolled out in primary and special schools due to, due to be completed by the end of the summer term. And finally, the Princess of Wales teamed up with tennis champion Roger Federer to celebrate Wimbledon's ball boys and girls. Kate joined the eight-time Wimbledon champion and watched a training session where youngsters were hoping to impress selectors and bag one of the 250 spots for the tournament next week. The Princess, who's the club's patron, has praised the hard work of the ball boys and girls, describing them as amazingly professional. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Angela. Thanks for that, Tatiana. Now, let's return to the confusing events that are going on in Russia right now. Now, the leader of the ruthless Wagner mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, took over the southern city of Rostov-on-Don on Saturday morning and began, as he puts it, marching for justice all the way to Moscow before appearing to strike a deal that saw him withdraw his forces. But what does all of this mean for Ukraine? Well, to answer that question, I'm joined now by Olensky Goncharenko, who is a Ukrainian Member of Parliament, and also by the former head of the British Army, Lord Richard Dannett. Um, Olensky, thank you so much for joining us from the Ukraine. I'd like to begin with you, first of all. Clearly, um, this was seen in the Ukraine as an opportunity for the forces to actually benefit from this so-called mutiny that was going on. Are you now anxious that, in fact, Putin is going to double his efforts and uh, unleash even more firepower on you now just to prove that he really is the strong man who is still in control of the country? Hello, uh, my name is Oleksii. Uh, thank you very much for invite inviting me. Um, first of all, Putin, Putin showed to the whole world it's his weakness. He is extremely weak, and even Homer would see it, you know, everybody sees it now in the world, and Russians also. Like Prigozhin, it was a definitely attempt of coup d'etat, and he was very close. He just got scared at the end to go to, to the end, uh, and he stopped his army near Moscow, his column, and he took big money uh, in order to stop what he is doing. But Putin is so weak, just imagine the state in which gang of mercenaries took control of one of the biggest cities in the country and attacked the capital. And during this attack, they destroyed six Russian helicopters and one Russian military jet, killed a number of Russian uh, military men. After now, they are released from any convictions and now they are free to go to some another country. Just imagine this. How would you call this state? It's a failed state and Putin is a failed emperor. That is the reality. Speaking about the, how it will influence the war in Ukraine, uh, definitely, if this mutiny would continue several days longer, uh, better several weeks longer, that will be the end of Russian army in Ukraine. It was too quick uh, to exploit it uh, for our army. It was just in 24 hours. Uh, so I don't think that now it will, in short term, will change something on the battlefield. But on the middle term, it showed how weak is Russia. And uh, I'm even more sure today in Ukrainian victory than before. Um, Lord Richard, if I can come to you, would, would you agree with uh, Olansky there? That, um, but I mean, the fear presumably is that even as he agrees, Putin is damaged is, because he likes to be seen as the strong man of his country. Do you think he is going to unleash even greater firepower just to prove that he is still that strong man? Where he will take this firepower? Sorry, I'm, sorry, I was have... asking Lord Richard. <laughs> Lord Richard, um, what, what are your that's feelings? Right. That's fine. That's fine. Um, I think it's quite possible that he might. 
But whether that will have any great effect remains to be seen. What we've seen over the last 15, 16 months, when there have been successive attacks on uh, Ukrainian civilian areas, that um, the morale of the Ukrainian civilians has remained very high. Ukraine has been very robust in, um, in dealing with these things. I think the really interesting issue is what uh, the effect of all this is going to be on the battlefield, what the effect is going to be on the Ukrainian counteroffensive that is gradually building up its strength. Uh, because uh, there is no doubt that there were no winners on the Russian side out of the events of the last 24, 36 hours. Putin is damaged. His defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, is, um, is probably gone. Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff, his reputation is damaged. And Prigozhin, well, huh, let's wait and see what happens to him next. I think my worry about him, if he goes to Belarus and takes a significant number of his soldiers with him, that it's possible that he might try and launch another attack on Ukraine from Belarus. And I'm sure the Ukrainian higher command will make sure that they're watching that border very carefully. Yes, um, Mr. Goncharovsky, if I can ask you, please, the, the Wagner was said to be the most effective of the troops that were on that front line. Are you seeing any evidence that now that they are being withdrawn and, and integrated into the main Russian army, that in fact that army now is less effective than it was? Right, definitely, Russian uh, more, more troop, morale of Russian troops uh, has declined. Uh, definitely, Wagner Group was one of the groups which were uh, capable to attack, not many in Russian army. Now it's out of the game. Also, Russia lost a number of helicopters and uh, one, uh, fire, uh, one military jet. So Russian army is weakened. Is it weakened enough in order to Ukraine counteroffensive to receive a short-term, quick uh, uh, strategic result? We will see it in the next days, uh, maximum weeks. Uh, Lord Richard, uh, tell you what struck me as being very interesting about what happened in the last, what, 24 hours, was that as the, 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 the Wagner were moving up the M4 towards Moscow, they didn't have any opposition. It was almost, you know, when, when they were in Rostov on, on Don, um, none of the troops there came out to resist them. They stayed in their barracks. There was no resistance as they made their way further up the M4. What does that tell you about the attitude of the, the supposedly loyal Russian troops to what the Wagner troops were trying to achieve. Well, Angela, you've just said it, supposedly loyal. When you've got a, a coup or, or, or a mutiny like this, the, the role and the actions of the government forces are very interesting. Uh, what the regular army could have done is opposed uh, the Wagner group, or in this case, it chose not to. Now, the big issue was what Prigozhin was really trying to achieve by driving up the M4 from Rostov all the way to Moscow. Did he think he would actually get all the way there? Did he think that he would depose uh, Putin from the Kremlin? No, I, I don't think he did. Um, and even if the regular Ukraine, R Russian army had not opposed him, I think the uh, loyalty of the SFB uh, and the interior troops would put on Putin's behalf would probably have stopped him. So I think Prigozhin actually realized that his headlong rush towards the Kremlin was going to get him nowhere. So it was very much in his interest to use the excuse of, I'm turning back to avoid bloodshed, to be able to climb down. But it's extraordinary that um, having been accused of all kinds of crimes, he is now being exonerated, excused, charges against him dropped, and he's allowed to go into exile, supposedly, in Belarus. Um, everybody on the Russian side is damaged as a result of all this. Yeah. And I think this will have an effect on the morale and the leadership of Russian soldiers in the front line, which will only benefit in the short to medium term the Ukrainian armed forces as they rank, wrap up, or, um, increase the strength of their counteroffensive. Well, I think that must be um, music to your ears, Mr. Goncharenko, but I understand that Putin has just been on Russian television where he says that he, um, literally within the, while we've just been talking and saying that he is very confident of his uh, of the ability of his troops on the front line. But um, clearly you have a rather different message that you would like to get back to Mr. Putin. There he is now. He was just speaking just a few moments ago and he's he just saying basically that he has every confidence in his troops and that he has every confidence 
confidence in uh, the future of his um, of his attacks against the Ukraine. Um, what do you say to that? What another would, could we hear from Putin? He tries to show his confidence, but what is the confidence? Like a gang of mercenaries were moving throughout through the whole country, and he couldn't stop them. We see that Russia militarily is exhausted. All their forces are in Ukraine, and in reality, Russia, all other parts of this huge country are absolutely unprotected. Uh, th that is the reality. So Putin tries to show some confidence, but in reality, his country is falling apart. That is the reality. And what I think the world, the free world, should prepare to is to collapse the Russian Federation. Uh, that happened several times in history. They had uh, the so-called time of troubles in 17th century. 100 years ago, Russian Empire collapsed. 30 years ago, Soviet Union collapsed. And now we can say clearly, the time of troubles, new collapse of Russian Empire has begun. And it's only the matter of fact, it's a final countdown already after what had happened yesterday. It's the matter of fact when it will happen. And nobody can stop and to prevent it. The only thing that the free world can do is to prepare for it. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I, I think, as I say, the, both of you agreeing there that um, Putin's time is running out. Only time will tell. But thank you both very much indeed for joining us. Now, the Windsor framework is one that was accepted by Parliament in March of this year to try and sort out the political and economic problems in Northern Ireland following our decision to leave the EU. It was negotiated by Prime Minister Richie Sunak and was meant to resolve the issues of the Northern Ireland Protocol. But it has left a trade border running down the Irish Sea that unionists say severs them from the UK economy and imposes extra burdens and costs. Well, the DUP has refused to enter power sharing in Storm in protest. So they've now presented an alternative of their own. It's been reported in the papers today and it involves what they term mutual enforcement of EU and British rules in Northern Ireland. And to explain exactly what that means, I'm joined now by Sammy Wilson of the DUP. A very good afternoon to you, Mr Wilson. Perhaps you would begin by just, because all of us haven't obviously had the opportunity of necessarily reading the entire document, what exactly are you proposing now to get you out of the political and economic mess that you have in Northern Ireland at the moment? I'm sorry, I think we seem to have a problem and I actually can't hear Mr Wilson. Hello? Hello? Mr Wilson? I can see him and I can see his lips are moving, but I can't hear what he's saying. We will try and get him back. Did he not, did he mute himself, I wonder? Are we, let us try him again and see if we can get Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, I, you can. I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? I can now, Mr. Wilson. Thank uh, you so much. Um, so, as, uh, a, as I say, would you mind please Thank explaining you. to us exactly what these proposals are that you've come up with? OK, uh, first of all, you're quite right. The Windsor Framework and the Northern Ireland Protocol have not sorted out the problems. We still have uh, a political problems in Northern Ireland. No unions accept the solutions which have been brought forward by the government and the EU. And of course, the economy and traders are being uh, affected by it. And it's, there's overreach into the rest of the United Kingdom. The, the, the idea that we put forward is not a new idea. It is simply an idea which, first of all, the UK government, contemplated putting forward at one stage um, under the title of dual regulation. One of the negotiators, Sir Jonathan Fall, also suggested that since this was used in other parts of the world and worked, that we should be trying it uh, for Northern Ireland. And we're now saying that now that clearly the solutions which have been put forward so far are not, are not workable, this is something which we tried. And it, it, it works very simply. Only about 5% of the companies in Northern Ireland uh, that exist actually trade with the Irish Republic. And instead of imposing EU rules on the whole of the Northern Ireland economy and then having a border in the Irish Sea, which has to be reinforced as a result of the Windsor Framework, what the government should be doing is saying to the EU, those traders who are trading with the EU and have got obligations in terms of the standards which have to apply to the goods, the customs arrangements and the taxes which have to be paid, we will enforce your rules 
by ensuring that those companies, <coughs> when they trade with the Irish Republic, pay the duties that they're due to pay, and uh, uh, adhere to the standards which they have to adhere to. And if they don't, then within our own jurisdiction, we will take sanctions against them. It is now, so simple, that means isn't it? You don't have to have a border. It is so simple. It isn't is it? simple, and, and it, it works. It, because it's so simple, the question has to be why you didn't come up with this at the very beginning when the original protocol was being discussed. It would have saved you all of these years of agony that you had with not being able to have proper power sharing in Northern Ireland. Well, the thing is, the UK government at one stage did contemplate this very all early on in the negotiations. The reason why it wasn't um, except it was because the EU wanted to use and has used Northern Ireland as a way of keeping its foot in the door of the United Kingdom as a whole. And indeed, as one of the negotiators, EU negotiators, suggested at the time, the price for Brexit will be Northern Ireland. And they, they then came up with the very complicated arrangements that we have under the protocol, which require a, 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 requires a border on the Irish Sea, requires EU customs posts uh, and uh, uh, trading posts in Northern Ireland and w restricts trade between GB and Northern Ireland, trade which should not be restricted and which under the law shouldn't have been restricted either. So, I mean, it's, it's not that uh, we didn't push it. It's not even that the British government didn't contemplate it. It was simply a political decision that was made. Let's get a deal with the EU. The EU is not going to accept this. Let's go for the much more complicated and unworkable <laughs> arrangements of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the Windsor Free Work. Well, let's hope that now that you've come up with this new framework that it is actually going to work because we said it's just so simple and it was obviously the, the, the route that should have been taken in the first place. Mr Wilson, thank you very well, much indeed for joining us this morning and explaining it. Thank you so much. Now, don't go anywhere because we've still got a lot more to come, including a new survey which says that women are embracing adventure as they hit their 40s. We're going to be speaking to traveller and author Alice Morrison, who's done just that. Like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, The People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. 
So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Welcome back. It's uh, 25 past 12 and you've joined me, Angela Rippon, sitting in this week for Michael Portillo. Now, a survey of over 2,000 women has delivered what some might find rather surprising results. Apparently, more than two-thirds of the women that were t spoken to said that they were excited to enter middle age. All the women in the survey were over 45 and nearly three-quarters of them said they considered midlife to be a period of personal growth and exploration, with travel listed as one of the highest priorities. Well, who better to discuss this than traveller and author Alice Morrison? She normally resides in the Atlas Mountains of North Africa, but today she joins us from sunny Scotland. A very good afternoon to you, Alice. Now, I have to say that um, there were some very impressive figures in this survey that you did. 72% of the women you spoke to said midlife was, um, they did not, they wanted to be a person of, uh, who was going to have growth and exploration. 66% of them said they felt there was less pressure to sit, fit into social norms. They wanted to live their own lives. I wonder how much of the results from this is actually a reflection of uh, your own awakening after 45. <laughs> Well, you've got a fair point, but this survey by Intrepid Travel, it does, it completely chimes with my experience. And in fairness, I had nothing to do with the survey, but I totally agree because when I was 48, <laughs> I um, quit my job as a CEO. Well, I was made redundant and I cycled from Cape Town. And ever since then, I have been adventuring full time. So I think what I found as a woman in midlife doing these amazing things was that I was in my full power. I was in my full power, Angela, just like you are. Um, and yes, I did exactly what Intrepid Travel say. I do want to explore. I do want to make new friends. And I do want to really use this time. But, but what do you think it is in yourself and indeed in the woman, women that were um, spoken to in this particular survey that suddenly makes them realise that that is what they want to do with their lives? Why weren't they doing it when they were in their 20s or their 30s? I think the thing is, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're probably working on your career, working with your family. Um, you have a lot of responsibilities, don't you? And you're in, you're in a great period of growth. And then suddenly you've got to a stage where you feel stronger in yourself and the future is stretching ahead of you. Because what I found is, you know, I suddenly came to the realization that time is finite and that, you know, there is going to be an end to all this. So if not now, when? So combined with, as I say, Intrepid Travel found that women have got more confidence. You know, it's not like the old days when you turned 40 and you were put in the bin. Now we're, we're taking over the world. So when you've got that confidence and you've maybe got a bit of time or you've got money or you've got both, but time is the real thing, then why not go off and travel the world? Come and join me. Come and hike in the Atlas Mountains with me. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. But you see, I wonder if this has an awful lot to do with the history of, of women in that our, our mothers, certainly perhaps not so much our mothers but certainly our grandmothers our great grandmothers going back several generations they their position in life was to get married have children and stay at home they didn't have the opportunity of doing all of this but so many of the 45 year old plus now many of them are children of women of the 60s who have got so much more freedom anyway that they've sort of passed that attitude down and an awful lot of the restrictions that were put on our on, on our ancestors just don't exist anymore I think that is, you've put it perfectly, to be honest, that is a perfect point. And if you think about it, I can't remember when it is, was it in the 60s that the, the term teenagers started? Probably. Well, now, <laughs> we are the teenagers, and you and me, Angela, are poster girls, because it's all about your thing. But what does this say about the children of these women who are 45 and now exploring the world? What does it say about the future for the, their children, for their daughters in the future? 
Well, I hope they'll continue on the tradition because I think I think if you see your mum in her 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s going off and doing something really exciting, and I think one of the ways to travel as a woman who's perhaps trying this, you know, it's, it's new to you, is to join a group. Mm -hmm. And I find that amazing. You know, before I went off and cycled across Africa, I used to every holiday, I would go on my own, but with a group of people and do an adventure. Um, and I run them now for Intrepid Travel. I do hiking the Alex Mountains. We do loads of stuff. But the point is, join a group or do it yourself. But if you if you see your mum doing that, you know, when you think she's ancient at the age of 50 or 60 or 70, I think it can only inspire you. So I would hope this, this momentum would continue. But I think it is really important to say to women, look, don't be afraid. You're brilliant. You can do it. Don't be put off. Don't don't watch too much Instagram and social media about what people who look like are doing adventures. Actually, people like me are doing really big, proper, roughy tufty adventures that used to be done by men with square jaws and those jackets <laughs> with loads of pockets. So you can do it too. So what Don't you agree? What adventures are left for you? <laughs> Oh my gosh, everything. Well, it was my 60th birthday last week. And on my 60th birthday, I did two things I had never, ever done before. I was in Saudi Arabia and I milked a camel, tick, yes. and I rode in a helicopter. So I think, honestly, there's always something new to do. Yeah, I don't think that milking a camel is on my list of things to do. But I think, you know, you are a great inspiration, I think, uh, Alice, to an awful lot of women of all ages that are watching this programme. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you so much. Well, in a few minutes, we're very excited here in the studio because we're going to be joined by pop legend of the 60s, Kiki D. But before that, here are your latest news headlines. Angela, thank you very much and good afternoon. This is the latest from the GB newsroom. Russia's president says he has every confidence in his troops who are on the front line in their continued war in Ukraine. It's after the leader of the Wagner mercenary group last night pulled his troops out to avoid bloodshed as they headed for Moscow on what's being described as an attempted coup. They were on their way to remove Russian commanders that Yevgeny Prigozhin blames for mishandling the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian MP Alexei Goncharenko believes Putin's time is running out. Uh, definitely, if this mutiny would continue several days longer, uh, better several weeks longer, that will be the end of Russian army in Ukraine. It was too quick uh, to exploit it uh, for our army. It was just in 24 hours. Uh, so I don't think that now it will, in short term, will change something on the battlefield. But on the middle term, it showed how weak is Russia and uh, I'm even more sure today in Ukrainian victory than before. The Chancellor says raising interest rates is one of the most effective methods to curb inflation. This week, rates were hiked up to 5% from 4.5%, the 13th rise in a row and the sharpest increase since February. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Jeremy Hunt is urging those struggling to be patient with the painful measures. All state secondary schools in England are now equipped with a defibrillator. The government says secondary schools received priority because the risk of cardiac arrest increases with age. The Department for Health says the device will also be rolled out in primary and special schools due to be completed by the end of the summer term. And the Princess of Wales teamed up with tennis champion Roger Federer to celebrate Wimbledon ball boys and girls. Kate joined the eight-time Wimbledon champion and watched a training session where youngsters were hoping to impress selectors and bag one of the 250 spots for the tournament next week. The Princess has praised their hard work, describing them as amazingly professional. You can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. 
like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Rooms, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Weeknights on GB News from 6 p.m. You'll always get drama. Please stop, Michelle. I'm going, oh yeah. Please stop. <laughs> Should I just shut off? Romance. You like me, I like you. There you oh, go. There you are. Well, don't tell anybody. Don't. Adventure. Da 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 da. Etc. That's the whole point. But, 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 yeah. And action. Sergeant, shut up. Read my superstar panel. They're already at it. They're fighting. It's going to be quite a show. Only on GB News. Britain's watching. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... I am so pleased that uh, the person who is sitting right opposite me now is my guest who really does not need much of an introduction at all because for six decades she's captivated fans all over the world with her soulful voice. Her hits include Amoureuse, I've Got the Music, In Me and of course Don't Go Breaking My Heart which she released in 1976 along with a certain Mr Elton John. But as I'm sure she's about to tell us, despite all of that success, she's never forgotten her Yorkshire roots, have you, Kiki D? No, they wouldn't let me. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were a young Yorkshire lass, yeah. 16, when you went into the music industry. Yeah, this this yeah. was your ambition, was it? Oh, totally. I was very driven, you know, when I was 14. <laughs> My dad and I drove down to London from Bradford uh, in 63, the same year that Scylla went to London. Mm -hmm. And um, got the audition, got the record deal, and uh, you know had lots of experiences. I sang with Dusty, doing backing vocals. Yeah. And Dusty Springfield, then, yeah. for the generation that have never heard of her. Yeah, who's Dusty? Sadly. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> Yeah, and then ten years later, I got hit with Elton John's company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we have to talk about Elton a bit, because, of course, tonight he's making what, what is being billed as his last ever public appearance in Britain as part of the, the Elton John farewell tour, because he's going right. to headline at Glastonbury. Yes. Um, now, you, you had Don't Go Breaking My Heart, as you say, which was this huge hit for you. Are, you. are you sad not to be there on stage with him tonight? To be honest, I'm quite relieved in this heat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the call, but, you know, I did Dodger Stadium last November to yeah. 55,000 people. Yeah. That was the North American farewell, and it was so wonderful. I saw my old friends when I was in L.A. a lot in the 70s, doing the rock star thing, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, it was, and the audience were fantastic. And when I came on, they went, where? And then jo I met Joni Mitchell backstage, which yeah. was wonderful. Now, come on, Kiki, tell me. I mean, because none of us watching this programme will have had the experience of walking out onto a stage and oh seeing 65,000 people in front of us no. wanting to... What is that like? 
Well, you know, I did two stadium tours around America with Elton in the 70s. Yeah. So I got used to the police escorts to the stadiums, you know, and, and the Starship, which was a rock and roll uh, aeroplane that the Stones and Elton used to use. What you do is you do a date and you'd stay in one city for a week and do all the dates around that city, <clears throat> excuse me, and then the plane would go on somewhere else. So you didn't have to move around every day. So rock and roll. The one silly thing I remember is on the, the sort of refreshment bar they had in those days, 73, 74, they had these packets of vitamins, you know, for all the rock and rollers to keep us all going on these long tours, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, the atmosphere. Um, I remember talking to Yul Brynner many years ago about what it was like when he was living with cancer to go on stage yeah. uh, and perform in The King and I, and he said always it was that wave of love that came over the headlights, yeah. of, over the footlights to him, which was like Doctor Theatre. Now, you know, you didn't have any of that to go through, but you did... I mean, I can't get over 65,000 people. Do you feel that wave of energy coming at you when you walk out and when you're performing? Well, it's a strange thing because um, I do... Uh, I have a music partner called Carmela Lugeri I've yeah. been working with for 30 years. And our music's quite progressive, although we do the old hits. But, you know, we play art centres to 200 people. Mm. And I find that much more terrifying because it's the intimacy. Really? And there's nowhere to go. You have to connect. Connection is the whole thing about our yeah. music. It's to touch people. And that, to me, to go out, walk out on at Dodgers Stadium and, you know, belt out a song for three minutes um, is much less scary. It's crazy, I know, but... It's crazy. Uh, but it was, it, it was crazy. And, in fact, the whole Elton experience must have been crazy, going on tour with him, with, with all the glamour and all the, the, the craziness that went with it. I gather you have... I read somewhere that you've got a pair of rhinestone-studded, platform-heeled boots I do. from that time. I do. How did they come about? <laughs> and I can still get them on, which is, which is a miracle, you know. Yeah. Well, they, everybody wore them in the 70s. Um, they're silver, and then they've got the rhinestones, and then beautiful, actually, just under the knee. And what they... And you still they, got them? I've got them in the loft. <laughs> they make a great doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> I did wear them at once at a gig with Carmelo, actually, um, just for fun, you know, and everybody yeah. went, oh, my God. But what was great about that style in the 70s was they made your legs look so long because you'd have these flared jeans, which we all wear now again, but your feet would be, like, you know, this much... Your legs would be that much longer because of these raised boots. So yeah. we all look like Jerry Hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite, actually. But <laughs> now, I know you are reported as saying you wanted to get away from that rock and roll lifestyle. I mean, but it was a fantastic time, wasn't it? And your parents got to get involved in it as well, didn't they? How did they take to it, seeing, you know, my little Kiki D from Yorkshire oh, up there on the stage with the big names? Well, the worst thing was when I was first Kiki D, because everybody in Brett was going, what? Because you kind changed of, your name. What kind of name is that? Yeah. yeah. Kiki D. Um, but, yeah, I've got a lovely story. Have I got time yes, to tell you? Yes, you have. Plenty of time. I, I played uh, Madison Square Garden for seven nights with Elton in 76. I was doing Don't Go Breaking My Heart. And uh, don't, uh, I've got the music in me. Yeah. And we had a gospel choir, and it was fantastic. So I rang my mum in Bradford, and I said, Mum, I know you and Dad have never flown, but how about flying to New York first class? Sailing for a week, s sailing home on the QE2, and, um, yeah, stay at the Waldorf Astoria for a week, you know. And there was a bit of a pause, and she said, well, we would love, but we booked our caravan holiday that week. <laughs> <laughs> I love did my mum. Did she mom. come? She did come in the end. <laughs> but, you see, that's the kind of roots I've got, and I think that's held me in really good stead. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but you did say you, you didn't want that rock and roll lifestyle. I mean, it was glamorous, it was fun. You were touring the world with the great names in music at that time. Yeah. And actually, just thinking about it, you were mentioning there Scylla and Dusty. Yeah. Um, Scylla Black, Dusty Springfield. Mm. There weren't too many women around at that time headlining as pop singers, were there? You, you were one of a, a very small and elite group of women, weren't you? Did that make it really tough for you in the music industry? Well, there were less... Mm. Less artists, and you had to have a record deal to record. Mm. Of course, now everybody can record in their back room and, you know, get a record deal and whatever. But and 
I can't keep up with so many new artists. There's always great singers, even, you know, nowadays mm. there's still great singers out there. Um, I forgot what you asked me. I'm, I was I'm having so much fun. <laughs> I was asking about what it was like to be one of that small elite oh, group yeah. of, of top liner women singers, along with Scylla and Dusty and, and the rest of them. Well, you it, were just a very small group, weren't you? We were, actually. That's, that's true, in a way. I mean, I didn't get a hit until 73. And at the time, I was a bit, oh, I want to hit, you know, yeah. <laughs> being young. And, but it worked out well in the end because I'd kind of got a bit of experience under my belt mm -hmm. before Amoureuse hit the charts. And I always say to my audiences, you know, it's so wonderful to get your first hit record with a beautiful, timeless song, because mm. it might not have been. Yes. But, do, I mean, were you all great mates as well? Did you sort of talk to each other? Did you sort of share experiences and share, share stories? Mm. I didn't know... Um, I didn't know um, Scylla that well, but I did not met all the girls, and, mm. and we were all kind of supportive, really, we were. And Dusty was the one that I, I really got to know because we had the same manager. Yes. And I, there's a beautiful song she recorded called Some of Your Loving by Carole King in 64. <clears throat> I've got a frog today, sorry. And uh, I sang backups on that, and I think it's one of the best vocals she did. It's beautiful, you know. So I was so starstruck because I do love her voice to this mm. day, you know. Mm. But you did get away from the, the, the sort of the rock and roll life. How did you manage that? How did you do it? Well, I think it's just evolution. You know, I, I got to a certain age where I thought I've been chasing this stardom dream since I was 16, you know, and it was wearing thin, actually. Mm. I thought I want to do... I want to do what I want to do. I want to try new things. I want to move on, move forward. Because the artists I love do, like Robert Plant, people like that, they're always experimenting, doing new things. Um, so I grew out of it. And also, when you're older, of course, now I only do two shows consecutively in a week because I give so much to the audience, and there's just two of us on stage, that I, I feel I can't do the third show... I can't do as good a job. So it's my evolution, you know, that's mm. the way it's gone. What, what were your dreams as that little girl in Yorkshire? What did you see? What did you want at that stage? What, what were the ambitions? I think, uh, you know, it's so different now because stardom is... Well, that's a whole subject, isn't it? Yeah. You know, people want to be stars, but I wanted to... And they don't always necessarily have the talent to go with it, do they? But you clearly did. I had something. I knew I, knew I had something. I sensed. And I, to be honest, um, I'll be really honest, my dad was a very frustrated man. He tried ventures. He didn't get to put them into fruition. And, and I was doing it for my dad for a long time, because mm -hmm. I adored him, you know. And I wanted to... I wanted to make it and be known, mm. you know, as a young girl. Yeah. Well, that was the ambition. What was it then that made you realise, actually, that's not what I want out of life? There must have been a trigger, was there? Something that said, you know, you were well-known. You, you still are, but, you know, I mean, the name Kiki D, I mean, everybody still knows exactly who you are. But you were at the top of your profession. To, to switch that off, or even if not to switch it off, but to, to, to run it down and have an entirely different way of life, that must take quite a lot of deciding, did it? Because not every star at the head of their profession can say, quit while you're ahead, because I've still got a long... I mean, you were still young. You're still, yeah. you're still performing. You had this long career ahead of you. So what was the trigger that made you think that was not the ambition anymore? I just wanted to feel comfortable. And I was You were always... not comfortable then? I was always quite shy. Uh, I used to... In, you know, there'd be lots of cameras on Elton and I, and I'd be, you'd, you'd always see me kind of going behind his shoulder, you know. I was shy. Um, not that confident. And also, the other thing is, I, would, I didn't have one particular direction. I wasn't a country singer or a folk singer or a rock singer. I was trying all these different things. And in the end, I thought, I just want to have the freedom, you know, to feel comfortable. Because I am a down-to-earth person and... Uh, I just wanted to feel more relaxed. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. So yeah. when you're on stage now, because you, you perform now with Carlos, as you have done for, yeah. what, 30 years yeah. or more, are you performing all your own material now? You're still writing your own songs? Yeah, we do a mix of the Kiki hits and we do songs from Kate Bush. You know, we do covers of other people's mm. songs and our original material. So it's a bit of a musical journey. 
and I just love it because I'm much more confident now. I, you know, I go out into the audience and we have a good giggle, and uh, it's real. Mm. You know, I think that's what it is about being over 70. Is you know, you kind of begin to know who you are, and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's where I am now, and I'm very happy. You're now 76, aren't you? Yeah. So who is Kiki D now that wasn't Kiki D when she was 16 or 20 or 26 or 30? I don't regret anything I've done. Um, I'm very straightforward. Uh, I, I don't think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, but I do love the level I'm on now because, as I said earlier, it gives you freedom to mm -hmm. be creative. Because fame, I think, can be uh, a very difficult thing to work through if you're trying to create things. Mm -hmm. Because you've got pressures of record companies and all that commerciality. I don't have that anymore. No. So I'm just a simple gal from Yorkshire. <laughs> but I mean, so what would your message be to a lot of the young... Because as you say, the music industry is... is the churning over yeah. of stars, of names, of bands, mm -hmm. is extraordinary, I think, now compared to what it was, say, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. Um, you know, the, a band pops up, it has a hit, it does a al couple of albums, and then we never hear from them again. Yeah, it's difficult. What would you say to them? Because clearly they are not surviving within the industry for a variety of reasons, but what would your message be for them to get the kind of longevity that you and other stars like you have achieved? I think if I look back, it was a very different industry in the 60s, yeah. but I would say if you concentrate on the work and enjoy it and let it unfold and not run ahead of yourself, you know, because this fame thing is definitely... a takes you over. Yeah, do you, th do you think they believe their own publicity too much? I think so, and, and it happens so quickly as well. You see, I, I had that ten years to go out and work. Before you had a big hit. Before I had a yeah. hit. Um, <clears throat> it's keeping your feet on the ground and believing in what you do and not letting people sidetrack you into being what you're not. Yeah. I, that's what I would... Stay true to yourself. Stay true. Yeah. So tell me what it is about the partnership you have with Carlos that, that works so well. I mean, it's, as you say, 30 years you've been working together now. Well, Carmelo's an amazing guitarist. Uh, he's worked with Bill Wyman, lots of people, done lots of projects. We met when I was 47. Yeah. And that was the point when I thought, I've got to do my own music, you know, I've got to get real here. And um, he's just fantastic and he, he, he does all our arrangements and he produces our albums. And we, musically, we, we seem to work. Yeah. Um, and like I said earlier, I think working at this level, I can hear my vocals on stage, because with a big band, you know, and in a big stadium, you can't really hear very much. You know, you're just relying on, you know, ear ear in-ear plugs yeah. or monitors, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it's one of those intangible things that just works musically, you know. Yeah. And so what sort of material are you writing together now? I'm sorry, I called him Carlos, he's Carmelo, of course. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What sort of material are you writing together now? Well, um, it, it's very grown up in the sense of I don't write love songs with baby in them anymore, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't particularly like pop. I like music these days. I like uh, real instruments, um, organic sounding. So the songs are about the journey of life because I, all my lyrics are uh, really come from myself and my experiences. I don't think I can write in the way maybe Kate Bush can by reading a book and taking a subject. I just have to write from emotion. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's a song I wrote called She's Smiling Now about my mother, um, who was a wonderful lady, very kind. And there's a line in the song, uh, it's never too late to fall in love with life again. I'm very proud of it. So that's the kind of content some of the songs are fun as well, but it's the, it's the truth of the music that I like. Mm. Yeah. We mentioned, let's go back again, because we mentioned uh, that this evening Elton is... Yeah. You, you've stayed very good friends with Elton, haven't you, all, all through the years? Oh, he's, he's, he's amazing. Every time I'm, I'm unwell, because I was a little bit unwell yes. earlier this year, I get the phone call. You all right? <laughs> I'm keeping my eye on you, you know. You know. He rang me on his birthday because he found out I wasn't very well. But I don't see him, I don't mix in his circle because it's an unreal life, let's face it. I mean, my life's very normal. But he, it's a true friendship and I would say he's 
you know, of all the people who've touched me in my life, he, he's definitely well up there, you know. Yeah. So will you be... You won't be at Glastonbury this evening. No. But will you be watching? I will. I can't wait to see who's going to be on. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? He says he's going to have four people on, but we don't know who they are. No, it's you a secret. I've no idea. Who do you think it might be? No, honestly, I don't know. I heard Billy Joel was in London. It might be him. Yeah. Do a leaper. He worked with in LA. Lady Gaga, I think, is in yeah, the mix. Who isn't knows? She? I mean, yeah. But you're looking he, forward to it. He this loves evening. to mix it up. He does, doesn't he? So you're, gonna, you're looking forward to it this evening. I am absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. you and thousands of others too. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kiki. It's been such a delight to be able to see. You. When you came in, you said, "I'm going to pretend we're having a cup of coffee in the lounge." That's, That's what right. I've done. Fantastic. Massive thanks to you, Kiki. Thank you. To Kiki and indeed to all of my guests today. Michael will be back next week. Up next, it's Emily Carver. Enjoy your weekend. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Vautry, here with your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is certainly going to be a hot day for some of us. Southerly winds feeding up, bringing in this heat, particularly for southern and eastern areas of England. But for others, it'll be a bit more unsettled. This low pressure centre bringing this cold front across Northern Ireland first thing this morning and will gradually bring some heavy outbreaks of rain to Scotland's northern England and into parts of northern Wales as well. Chance that some thunderstorms bubble up across parts of Lincolnshire up into Yorkshire and Northumberland. Some heavy rain still across Aberdeenshire into Orkney as well. Eastern areas of Northern Ireland also seeing some heavy showers this afternoon as well. Further to the south, staying dry, but that heat really building, climbing towards 32 Celsius. Really quite humid as well, feeling sticky. It's going to be a blustery day for many of us, though, and it will continue to be breezy for those eastern areas as that rain eventually clears its way off. But it should turn drier for many of us overnight, just a scattering of showers.